straight to quarters. Run out the gun. Stand by this tavern battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Linstock's ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. Wonderful and exciting days. Even now, after so many years, and knowing what trouble and hardship was to come, I'd still elect to live them again, had I the choice. Yet on the morning when the captains of the squadron sat in the Admiral's cabin discussing the forthcoming operation, I was full of foreboding. Admiral Layton had censured me for leaving the squadron, despite my success. I could not but feel that he still suspected me of having been the lover of Lady Barbara before her marriage to him. And now I again found myself opposing him. Then, uh, we're agreed, gentlemen. The capture of the town of Rosas, if it can be affected, will throw the French plans for the subjection of Catalonia into confusion. Our three ships can supply a landing party of 600 men, and Captain Hornblower will lead them. His experience of the Spanish during his imprisonment there and his command of the tongue make him the obvious choice. Uh, <clears throat> I trust you'll forgive me for saying, sir, that it might be unwise to trust so entirely to the cooperation of the Spanish army. But they have 7,000 men at Olet, ready to march. It's only 30 miles from Olet to Rosas. Yes, sir, but over mountain paths. Can we be sure that they have that number or that they will come? I'm sorry to be so insistent, sir, but I have painful experience of Spanish promises. It's seldom to be relied on. That's nonsense, Captain Hornblower. I have General Rivera's definite promise to march. Uh -oh. Well, what alternative do you suggest, then? Well, I would suggest, sir, that we confine ourselves to actions within our own strength without having to rely on Spanish help. My instructions are to cooperate as closely as possible. Now, Rosas has a garrison of no more than 2,000 men, and Rivera has 7,000 only 30 miles away. The French army cannot reach Rosas in less than another week. We can supply heavy guns, men to work them, and more men to lead a storming column when we've effected a breach. It can be done easily before the French army arrives. So I fail to understand your objections, Captain Hornblower. I did but state them at your request, sir. I ask for helpful suggestions, not objections. I look for more loyalty from you, Captain. I can assure you of my loyalty, sir. Very well. And we can start at once. I trust we're on the eve of the most resounding success the Mediterranean coast of Spain has ever seen. Uh, careful with that gun, man. If it slips off the pontoon, it'll be nothing but two and a half tons of useless metal. Now, he's there. I want all ten guns at the top of that cliff before dawn. Pardon, senor. You are the English captain? Captain Horatio Hornblower at your service. I am Colonel Juan Claro. I bid you welcome in the name of General Rovira. Thank you, sir. I bring a thousand men, fifty horses, and a hundred mules. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, it will take 50 horses to drag one of those 24 pounders over this country. They're going to be kept busy, sir. I have combed the country for animals, senor. These are all I can muster. Very well, then we must harness men, too. I have a horse for you, Captain. Thank you, Colonel. Would you be so kind as to send a messenger to General Rivera telling him that I hope to reach Rosas with at least some of the guns at noon? Mm, certainly, Captain. And I must ask for the help of your men to transport my guns and stores. 400 will help with the guns, and another 400 will carry one 24-pound cannonball each. But, Captain, this is not possible. And after that, they will return here for more. I was promised a sufficiency of pack animals. If you do not supply me with four-legged ones, I must use those with two. Now, pardon me while I get the column started. Ready? Aye, aye, sir. A lot ten horses and mules to each gun and a hundred men on the drag ropes. Send a hundred men ahead to clear the path. They must roll rocks out of the way and fill in holes. Aye, aye. Now, see that every Spanish soldier is at work. Aye, aye, sir. Guns and stores dragged wearily on under the blazing sun. Colonel Claros and I rode ahead with his three staff captains behind us, and young midshipman Longley and Coxon Brown acting in a like capacity for me. But when at last we reined our horses at the top of the last of the rocky undulations and gazed down at the town of Rosas in the plain, I knew that it would be many more hours before my guns were ready for the siege. In five hours, the first gun had traveled little more than three miles. Pondering this, it was a few moments before I was struck by the general peacefulness of the scene below. Colonel Carlos, the plain is almost deserted. Where is General Rivera's army of 7,000? They were to have been besieging the town. You told me they were marching last night. They do not seem to have arrived yet. But this is serious. My men and stores are strung out over three miles of country, sir. Within easy reach of any column, the town of Rosas might care to send out. What of the messenger you sent at dawn to General Rivera? Says he returned? The messenger? Oh, yes, I remember. He did not go. He didn't go? What? I would, it would have been to put somebody to unnecessary trouble. If the general comes, he comes. If not, no messenger can bring him. I might have expected this. Even a squadron of cavalry there who are watching the city haven't bothered to report the non-arrival of the army. We're in considerable danger here. Oh, no, my men are used to mountains. If the town garrison attacks us, we can get away. Get away? We're here to attack men, not to fly. What of my guns and men? My dear captain, in war there is always danger. Mr. Lumley! Sir? Come here. Ride back at once. Halt the guns, halt the convoy, halt every man on the path. Nothing is to move a yard further without orders from me. Aye, aye, sir. Aye, sir. Not a gun or man moves until I see Rovira's army on that plane. Now, will you send a messenger to him? Very well, if you wish. See to it, Lieutenant. And uh, now, sir, it is the hour for dinner. <laughs> Will you have my men's food served to them, Captain? Your men? Am I to feed a thousand of your men from my ship's stores? I, I thought you'd made your own arrangements. As you wish, Captain, but if they are not fed, they will disperse in search of food. <laughs> and who shall say when they will return? Oh, God, the... the fact is... Ca... Oh, damn. Very well, I, I, I'll feed your men. <laughs> Nothing else to be done. I fed them, and when they'd eaten, they lay in the scrub and slept. The siesta was sacred, even in war. But I could not eat. And I scribbled a report to Admiral Layton and walked about fretting until his reply came. And the reply was as futile and unpractical as I might have expected. Excuse me, sir. Look. What is it, Brian? The fog is down there on the move. They're coming out of the fortress, sir. Yes. Three columns of them. <laughs> Not a good that cavalry pick it is, sir. They're galloping back to the Spanish army as fast as they can. Those columns seem endless. There must be at least a thousand men in each and more coming. But the Spanish estimated the garrison strength at less than two thousand. I see their plan. Two columns to attack us directly, one to cut off the retreat to the mainland. There's not a moment to lose, Brad. Captain! Uh, Captain! They are attacking, Captain. We must get away. You'll surely not abandon the convoy, Colonel. I cannot afford to lose my army. If I march them now, there is just time to get away. What? Unfortunate, senor. A military necessity. Yes. 
That's a sort of allies to have first, isn't it, eh? <laughs> well, open the columns, chaser, and cut them to pieces. Quick, Brown, back to the Marines. Major! Hey, oh. Not this task for you. We'll have 3,000 French on us inside an hour. Your Marines will have to hold them back while we get the stores back to the ship. Right? Well, you'll be a job. You wouldn't be thinking of a bounding in the store, sir? No. It might be worth losing them to save the lives of trained seamen, but the shock to morale of leaving the guns after so much trouble to get them here would be enormous. No, we must fight a rear guard action, Major. I will do that. Long way! Yeah. Right to the beach. Tell the Admiral we must re-embark uh, men and stores and ask for boats to take us off. Aye, aye, sir. Aye. far as the head of the cliff overlooking the beach. The beach party was hard at work reloading the barrels of bread and beef. And at the head of the cliff, a party of seamen were unloading the first mule train. Bring those mules back to the guns as soon as they're unloaded. Aye, aye, whip. Come along there. Brian. Come, you stay with me. I may need messengers. Listen. Sounds as though Major Laird is already in action. Let us go back and see what's happening. There's Major Laird on that high rock above the plot. Yeah. He's got his men stuck out along the top of the ridge. Oh, well, Major Laird. Yeah, you look as though you're enjoying yourself. Aye. Right. Come up and see for yourself. Yeah, hold my horse, Brad. I'm going up. Now, Major Laird, what's the position? Well, you'll observe that the foreign troops have to keep to yon parts in this sort of country, and his skirmish will soon lose the direction. This thorny vegetation is helping us fine. Do you see yon cluster smoke? Yes, that's my men heading in the scrub. Yes, but the French are coming on. I can see them. If you didn't keep your head down, sir, you'll not see anything long. You see that French column to the right? When it reaches yon thorn tree, you will have to retreat and take up a fresh position. been firing at me without a hit yet, but with two of us up here, the possibility is double kick. Uh, in other words, you'd like me to look after my business and leave you to look after yours. Huh? Very well. I'll... Have you hit? No, but that one's ruined my cocked hat. All right, Major, I'll go and hurry the convoy. Guns as good as these. Don't let him have them as a present. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's funny. Let them take us with it. Look at that, sir. The Spaniards have run away. You can see them climbing the hill beyond the plain over there. Allies or not, I could almost wish they'd been cut off. They hate foreigners. They hate each other. If they will not settle their differences and keep their promises to their allies, they'll never again rule their own country. Have a come. I can't waste time in talking. All the afternoon under the blazing sun, the back-breaking work dragged on and the Marines fought their heroic rear-guard action, yielding their ground only inch by inch and keeping the harassed Frenchmen away from the retreating guns and stores. Problem after problem presented itself and was solved. I rode continuously between the rear-guard and the beach, advising and encouraging the men stifling my doubts as to whether the efforts and loss of life were justified by the saving of the guns. And at last, most of the guns were on the beach, and the rest were at the head of the gully. All the stores were safe aboard. Cavendish, who was in command on the beach, came up to me. What about the horses and mules, sir? There's 150 of them. Shipping them will be quite a job. There'll be a nuisance on board, too, sir. it would be more of a nuisance to allow them to fall into the hands of the French. I'd rather have their throats cut on the beach. Oh, I... I hope that won't be necessary, sir. Maybe we could feed them on crushed biscuit aboard. They look as if that would be a luxury to the food they have been getting. If you'll leave it to me, sir, I'll ship them. Very well, Captain. Just send them on board with the stores. Aye, aye, sir. Now, Mr. Longley. Sir? This is going to be the decisive moment. From this point, we can overlook both the beach and the gully where the Marines must make their final stand. And we shall... Here they come now, sir! <laughs> There's Major Laird, right on the top of the cliff. And the prince are right on their heels. Oh, keep down, you fool. 
operation was John. Your men did splendidly, Major Laird. I trust your losses were not excessive. No, too bad, considering. The French has lost ten for every one of mine. Aye, a very handsome operation. Handsome, indeed. A day spent unloading and loading, dragging lug guns up and down cliffs, fighting, leaping down precipices like goats. And, and for what? Hardly your fault, sir. Until my officers have submitted the casualty lists, 
All the stores were saved and all the guns, with the exception of one, which was carried, carried away its tackles and went over the cliff. I shall make arrangements to have it salvaged tomorrow. Yeah. You appear to have carried out a very successful retreat, Captain Hornblower. Nevertheless, it was a retreat. I had hoped for a resounding victory in the capture of the town of Roses. So had I, sir. Yeah. Hmm. I shall be glad to receive your official report in writing. No actual blame attaches to you, of course. However, I must stress, Captain Hombra, in dealing with our Spanish allies, it is essential to use that tact and persuasion which ensures their fullest cooperation. You said something, Captain Hombra? No, morning, sir. Uh, merely a <clears throat> slight difficulty with my breath, sir. Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.